The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 148. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Next Generation uh, story, first season story, called Justice. And joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Have you ever noticed how the (laughs) first season shows tend to have one-word titles like this one? It's just Justice. And if you look at... If you look at other shows, you see the same thing. Like the X-Files first season, mm-hmm. you have episodes like Fire and Ice and <laughs> things like that. And it's a, what is it? It's, come on, people. You can assume you're going to go more than one season and give your episodes more than one word titles. Like well, Discovery. You know, the butcher yeah. kills the, yeah. the lamb in the silence of the night or something. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> the, the lamb's knife cares not for the butcher's cry to make the <laughs> sanest man go mad. Yeah. <laughs> and Father Cory Stika. Hi, Father Cory. <laughs> Howdy, Dom. And if there was justice, this episode would not exist. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. one, of the, one of the worst of the worst season of Next Gen. Yes. 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 Uh, before we get into that, I do want to encourage everyone to follow The Secrets of Star Trek on in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at the SQPN YouTube channel, where you should make sure to also hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes. All right. Yes, as you've heard, we're talking about this first season episode called Justice. It was the eighth ep- episode of the season. Uh, the basic plot is they discover a new class M planet full of, uh, you know, peace and Love, free love hippie types all blonde and barely dressed uh they go down to visit wesley crusher goes along he inadvertently violates a minor law and then they find out that every law on the planet has one every crime has one punishment death uh meanwhile there's aliens in orbit who are like gods to these people and they don't want the enterprise crew interfering and so picard has to find a way to both not violate the prime directive and tick off the godlike being in orbit and mm-hmm. while also not leaving Wesley Crusher to die. And so uh he and he does. And we'll you know, we can talk about exactly how all that works as we get to the end. And from another perspective, if there was justice, this episode would have ended differently with respect to Wesley. Yeah, I was gonna say I think a lot of fans would have preferred that <laughs> Picard just says, Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> See you later, Wes. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Yeah. If you're not remembering it from a concrete image will help. This is the one where Wesley steps on flowers and faces the death penalty. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's like, hey, that's okay. I'm not hurt. I'm okay. I'm okay yeah. here. <laughs> you know, it, it, I will I will say, though, you know, Will Wheaton, if you see him today, he is a good actor. Oh, yeah. He's obviously yeah. improved. Oh, yeah. He's obviously yeah. improved. Since, actually, well, he was a good actor even before. Like, if you see Stand By Me, he's, he is, yeah. was a good actor as a kid. It's yeah, that's not his fault. Getting so bad. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's given better material now. Yeah, yeah. The what he was given to work with was pretty bad. So, yeah. But let's also address the, this right here. This is yet another first season episode that is racy and gets into Gene Roddenberry's weird uh, sexual oh, proclivities. It, it it gets into it, both of his things. Yeah, yeah. Because he has this sex obsession, and he has this God is not all he's cracked up to be obsession. Right, and this has both of those. It very closely resembles some episodes of the original series. In particular, it resembles the episode "The Apple." Oh yeah, where you have this planet of primitive people who are all blonde mm-hmm. and attractive and oversexed, and they have this god thing, Vaal, that's really uh, or Val, I think they say, who's really a computer that they end up destroying by the end of the episode. So 
you have the same thing, the oversex society with the God that isn't a God. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, other just to kind of I, I did a quick look at the rest of the season. Naked Now, Angel One. I mean, this like all of these, you know, stories where it's all about like the the sex stuff, but also right this there are also more of those God things, uh, you know, the anti God things. So yeah, that's interesting that you point that out. Um, it it starts with a captain's log as they do, and I I have to point this out. Picard says we've delivered a party of Earth colonists to the Strand Solar System, and we've just or Strand whatever that is. We've discovered another class M planet in an adjoining system, and so we were in orbit there, having determined to be inhabited and unusually lovely. And I'm thinking, what kind of half baked colonization survey for the Earth colony took place that didn't notice a developed civilization in the very next solar system? <laughs> like, come on, people, be, be, do your job better. Yeah, anyway. The Federation's just winging it. I know yeah. somebody somebody They're mailed getting, this one in. They're getting lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's better than, and I I actually really like Larry Niven's Known Space series, but it's better than the survey efforts in Known Space series. <laughs> they had you know Ram robots that found the locations for Earth colonies, but their programming was so bad they didn't find a habitable planet. They found a habitable point, <laughs> and then they would ship colonists off to it. And so you get these really weird environments where, like, okay. This planet is fine in the spring and the summer, but there are horrendous winds in the in in the other half of the year, and people have to live underground. <laughs> or on Mount Look at That, there is a single mountain that is high enough to be habitable over the otherwise poisonous atmosphere of this planet. <laughs> or te on Jinx, technically this planet is habitable, but its gravity is five times that of regular Earth gravity. <laughs> <laughs> I <like> Larry Niven. <laughs> so uh other people who don't do their job well in this episode include uh, Tasha Yar, who is her job is to look at all of the customs and laws of the people and make sure, you know, that they're going to abide by them and that there's no surprises, like, you know, that there's one cr punishment for all crimes, which is the death penalty. Uh mm -hmm. good job there, Tasha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and she, Riker she's... also agrees. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, both of them were uh, both Riker and Tashi are were a little too overawed by their uh, virility, <laughs> shall we say? Well, it is yeah. implied that Tasha and Will Riker both did other things on the planet besides their jobs. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, there should be uh, some some punishments handed out here. Uh, Jordy says uh, of the people they are wild in some ways and puritanical in others. I don't remember seeing the puritanical bits apart from the every crime the, is. I, I think the yeah. law keeping thing. Yeah. They're okay. really strict when they have laws. Right. He does say they, they make love at the drop of a hat, and Tasha says any hat, which I actually thought was kind of a funny line. It was it was a um, funny line, but it it was clear she was kind of blushing a little bit too. So Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just uncomfortable with that. And I was uncomfortable, especially once they beam down and yes. we see this society of people and I'm going, I don't want to have to sit here for forty five minutes watching these scantily clad women. This is Yes. This can be a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Worf was good. I liked Worf for this. <laughs> nice planet. <laughs> Which is, I got to say, that, that was Worf's good line. So the, the, so they do beam down, and then there's that weird, uncomfortable, you know, welcoming ceremony where everybody hugs. Oh. Uh, what do we do for the, the boy? Hugs yeah. very suggestively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's another theme in this that you just touched on, which is, Wesley, sending Wesley down to this planet of the oversexed California bleach blondes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's not age appropriate. Right. To the, I mean, he, regardless of what you think of these people's morals, he is not age appropriate to this situation. And right. that's a criticism that I think uh, would be made of this episode today in the wake of all kinds of mm -hmm. childhood, mm -hmm. you know, sexual scandals that this episode really leans into without pulling the trigger on it it does the over sexualization of children well right. they even they even say that he was sent down to evaluate whether or not it would be suitable for children to go for away mission or go for uh, shore, leave. shore leave yeah the and answer is like, no the answer is no <laughs> <laughs> don't even send wesley the answer is no right right exactly it's this it, is it, this is yeah. like space vegas in its not family friendly phase yeah. yeah or this is the this is the original version of risa right i mean this is yeah basically up, yeah 
with the the the, the little statues. Yeah, it, it, like they was say something about the the woman on the planet says, you know, oh, uh, oh, you're a you're a youngling or a child or I use the Star Wars term. Uh, well, I don't know what to do about you. And he's like, well, whatever you do with your teenagers. And uh, you see the the little hope in Wesley's eyes, and she's like, oh, okay. And she gives him this little like hug, like chased hug, and that's friend, it. And friend it's like hug, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was and then, like then so she weird. tells him where tells him where he can go find people of his own age. Right, right. Uh, and they go play. Uh, catch. Meanwhile, back on the ship, where things are less weird. Uh... <laughs> oh, by the way, I want to say, yeah. when they do beam down, it's like, oh, there's the Tillman Water Reclamation Plant in Los Angeles. Yes, we've um, seen that I several was times. That was at. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I, I have it in the back of my head all the way through this episode that this idyllic place is a sewage reclamation plant. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, it works. What I, I know what they're really processing here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems appropriate for this episode. Yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, the the I think this place shows up again in DS Nine. Yes. I think as a Starfleet headquarters. Uh, yes, as either Starfleet headquarters or Starfleet Academy. I forget yep. which. We see it several okay. times. Okay. Uh, now on the ship, Data is at his position. He says there's a reading of something off the starboard bow, but there's nothing actually here. He, he says there's nothing off the starboard bow. And at that point, I have, there's nothing off the starboard bow, starboard bow, starboard bow. There's nothing off the starboard bow, starboard bow, Jim. <laughs> that's, a, that's a reference to a British novelty song called Star Trekking. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, well, the funny thing is that there is a special effect in the view screen, like so that those of us watching see something there, which yeah. is kind of weird. I, I don't know what, why they did that, but. Well, they show us that, and then Picard says, Data, what the hell is it? And I'm going, it's a space station. It's perfectly <laughs> obvious. It's a space station. You have those two. <laughs> right. And uh, then he tells D uh, Jordy to go to a window, to look out a window, and take a quote-unquote real look with the visor, which mm -hmm. is kind of a cool idea uh, in itself. Yeah. Like, oh, Jordy, go look at it instead of look through a view screen. But why would the visor be more useful than, you know, a giant starship's huge suite of sensors? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and then as they're all explaining it, actually, this this line is might be the best line in it because Picard gets ticked off because as everyone's describing it, they're saying, well, it's something like this and something like that. And he says, why has everything become a something or a whatever? <laughs> it's only something <Yeah>. solid. <laughs> Memo to the writers of Voyager. Exactly. <laughs> Not not that th not that this episode doesn't have its own bad dialogue problems oh, yeah. because yeah. it's first season. Yes, yes, definitely. So the the this aspect of the crime and punishment on the this planet is that they have this. So every crime is punished by death, but not every crime is in, every law is enforced everywhere at all times. They have a punishment zone that moves around where the laws are enforced and monitored. It varies in location and duration every day, so no one knows where the very few police-like mediators are going to be. And so Wesley's bad luck is they he ends up, you know, stepping on the flowers and yeah. doesn't keep off the grass in the and, wrong place at the wrong and time. And the only way you know where this place is at is they put up basically white uh, benches around the do not go here zone. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's sort of two aspects to this. One is they put up the white markers, which someone off-world is going to have no idea what those mean. Yeah. Yes that tells you stay off these flowers, but it, there's still the question of, is a punishment zone here right, right now? Mm -hmm. And that's unannounced. You never know, is this a punishment zone right now? And it can change in an instant because mm -hmm. that later saves the rest of the main cast because <laughs> Wesley has stepped on the flowers and they're going to, the mediators are there and they're going to kill him. And the other, the rest of the main cast that's on the planet has just learned about this law, and they're rushing to to get everybody together, including Wesley, before anything bad can happen. They're too late. The mediators are there. They have a little syringe. They're going to inject Wesley with poison that will call him to cause him to die painlessly if mm -hmm. he's the right species, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and when they realize that that a mediator is just about to poison Wesley. The rest of the cast intervenes physically and assaults the mediators and, and gets the poison away from them. And I'm going, okay, I'm pretty sure you just committed a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what is, yeah. we, we, we just have a, we have a new problem now. And one of the mediators says, 
that uh, the punishment zone has just now this instant deactivated between when Wesley committed his crimes and when y'all <laughs> committed yours. So the rest of the cast is not on trial. Uh, so you you mentioned before that the di- there is dialogue in this episode that's really bad. This scene has some of the worst dialogue. Like, oh yeah, uh, Wesley, I'm with Starfleet. We don't lie. Well, except all the other times when they actually do. <laughs> we but, do, yeah. But okay, you're an idealistic young kid. But there's things like Tasha, like you know, picks up the needle full of uh you know a, a po- deadly poison and says it's a kind of syringe. It's like, <laughs> duh. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, what is this? You said death. Is this poison? Says Riker. It's like, um, duh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's what what it's would like, cause death that you find in a syringe? <laughs> right. It was just <laughs> such like needless expositing of this of what is blatantly obvious to everyone, including the viewer. Uh, yeah, it was really bad. Oh, a related thing is when they take Picard. Like, decides he's got to figure out what this thing in orbit is and so he's talking to this native woman and she's going oh you mean god and and he instead of just saying here's my phone take a look at this picture of the thing in orbit right he's got to beam her up to look at it through a window yep yeah and and she has this freak out experience at seeing her god and just kind of crumples and that makes God mad because he's taken they Picard has taken one of his children off the planet mm-hmm. and it's just needless over drama you could have just showed the woman a picture. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Do you recognize this? Yeah. So data at, at early on is once again we've seen we've seen this a lot of times data is the one because he's an android has to interface with the alien technology and so he gets all of the Starfleet's classified data is now downloaded mm-hmm. to yet another alien species because data you know, he knows everything the data knows now. Really yep. should think about having like a password protected vault and a <laughs> firewall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking. Well, we, yeah. Well, I like it where, the, you know, the uh, the aliens, uh, you know, or is, is talking to data through, you know, whatever, through Wi-Fi and says, oh, you were designed for information exchange. And it's like, no, data was designed to be an android that is a, <laughs> an officer on this ship. Yeah, computers right. were designed to be information exchange. Maybe yeah, go talk to them. That. <laughs> yeah. Also, they maneuver data into this situation because they can't talk to the aliens directly because, of course, the phones go down. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. it's like our phones are down, so we've got to find another way to talk to these aliens. So the aliens come over and data gets taken out by a forehead bubble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. A little special and- effect that lands on his forehead. And uh, oh, also the aliens speak so loudly that we hear rocks rumbling somewhere on the Enterprise. As well, yeah, the as, in the consoles, as, as the rocks in the consoles, you know, they gotta shake when the yeah. ship shakes. <laughs> right. And instead of calling an engineer when Data is knocked out, they call the chief medical officer who comes yeah. up and scans him to, that there's no sign of consciousness in his electronics brain. It, yeah. It's 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 first season. We don't have a regular engineer yet. So it's got to <laughs> oh, be the right. doctor. It be the <laughs> also, doctor. it gets Doctor Crusher involved so she can be horrified about her son. Yep. Yes, and, and then after so after they send the woman back down to the planet, mm-hmm. and and they've got till sundown. That's the deal. Yes. Now my mind is thinking, oh, you've got a transporter. Why don't you just keep beaming Wesley away from the Terminator? You can get all the time you need. Right. It's a big planet. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, no, we promised you he's still here on the planet. He's just further away from sundown he's, now. He's on the exact opposite <laughs> um, side where it's sunrise. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. But he's got till sundown, which we're told is very, very close. And Picard, after he beams the woman down, is he's met with Data and Crusher. He's learned that the, and this is the driving thing, that the the... Aliens have learned from data that we have this prime directive. We're not allowed to interfere with pre-warp civilizations, in which case, why are you even in contact mm-hmm. with these people? Mm-hmm. Because they don't have warp drive. Right. Right. Uh, Picard like goes to his quarters and is looking out the window at this thing, just contemplating. And I'm going, why aren't you actively trying to find a solution? Why are you sitting around <laughs> meditating on this thing <laughs> instead of pulling in your experts and your, I mean, you're a diplomatic mission ship. You've got to have cultural experts, and lawyers, who are, who are, and lawyers yeah. all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah. Um, Maybe and he's, just, he's just, yeah, he's just sitting around. 
So inexplicable. Also, Picard repeat and other people in the in the um, episode do the same thing. But this is I, I think this will be the only example of bad dialogue I cite because I don't want to harp on it. But <laughs> people repeatedly refer to Wesley as the boy. Yeah, and 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 Picard refers to talking to Data refers to Wesley as the Crusher boy, and it's like. Dude, nobody talks this way. No one will ever talk this way. This is completely <laughs> unrealistic dialogue. Right. So I was gonna say, is, is even on the planet when they're trying, when when Picard is trying to convince them to let Wesley go, you know, Wesley's gonna speak up. It's like, boy, this doesn't involve you. It's like, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. In a kind uh, of does. Actually, I, I will say that's the best line. <laughs> Wesley's like, I think this really does. I think this <laughs> yeah. is the one time it really does. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a. Uh... Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it'd be one thing if if it was a boy that Picard didn't know, like one some yeah. random kid on the ship. You know, oh, the son of you know the Smith boy. But yeah. this is Th- Wesley. This is, this is the <laughs> son of his best friend. Yes, yeah. exactly. The son of the woman who he apparently we've learned might have feelings for. You know, it's just yeah, that was a little too stilted. Uh, yeah. Picard then talks about the the history of capital punishment on Earth. <laughs> Some people felt that it was necessary, but we've learned to detect the seeds of criminal behavior. So capital punishment in our world is no longer considered a justifiable we're, deterrent. We're so much better. So we have pre-crime? <laughs> I, I, yeah. I love how the bleach blondes respond to that. It's like, oh, well, we must be such a barbaric, horrible species to you that you, with all your moral superiority and virtue signaling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but we like the fact that you run around like you're in Eden still. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah, got... there in in the backgrounds yeah. there are people making out all over the place through this yeah. episode. It's creepy. I'm sorry, but it just it, it's it comes really across creepy. As creepy. So I mean, is Brent yeah. Spiner's eye infection that he has in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. oh, God. One yeah, of his eyes is a lot more red than the other. Yeah, you could even <laughs> see where like they, they didn't put all the makeup underneath his eyelid because of it. it it's time. gotta be the the context of the makeup or something. They're yeah. probably still trying to get that right. So one thing that kind of interested me was like so Beverly has all this justifiable anger and angst over the mm-hmm. jeopardy that her son is in. And Data and Picard, like there's this one scene in, in the, I don't know, Picard's quarters or the lounge or something. They seem like pretty unconcerned. Like, like yeah. hey, she's just like, she approaches Picard at one point. And he's like, hey, later. Like, no, now. Like, you sent my son into danger. He is about to die. You need to talk about to me the now. I do think actually that that one scene is the one where that worked, and that's that's the scene where Picard is actually starting to to change his mind. Just because he he kind of said like it was it was it was it was phrased badly, but it was like hold on, we'll get we're we're getting there, you know. Okay. We're, we're, we're gonna talk about this in a second. No, it was like uh, they're in uh, sick bay because Data was taken down to sick bay instead of engineering, right? And that's where she, you know, he accuses Data of babbling, and they're talking, and they're talking, and she just. Just shut up and storms out. <laughs> yes. Which I thought was, was good. That was good. That was good. good. <laughs> and Data says, you're right, Captain. I do babble. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and Picard eventually does say the right thing to her. He, said, he, he assures her, look, you should know, whatever the cost, I will not allow them to execute your son. So Never give up. Never surrender. <laughs> never, yep. Exactly. And so they beam down, and it they, they, they comes to a point where he, they have to beam up. And they try to, but now, just like the phones went down earlier because aliens, now the mm-hmm. digital conveyor is offline because of <laughs> aliens. <laughs> right. And they can't beam up. And so the test is, can they convince the aliens to let them go, or are the aliens going to hold them to their prime directive standard? Yep. Right. And Picard makes this speech, which is a lot shorter than I remembered it being because it was so painful. <laughs> but... His point in the end is there is the, the like the last thing he says is there's no justice as long as laws are absolute. Mm-hmm. So he makes this assertion and I'm like, OK, yes, counselor, can you <laughs> can you argue for your assertion or are you just going to kind of leave it there and let the judge and jury fill in the details of how that is real? But no, the aliens then let him beam up and this amounts to a come on, please ending. Yeah. yeah, which is very non-creative and non-satisfying because what the writers have done is they put themselves into a horribly illogical situation and their final way out of it is just, come on, please. 
literally yeah. deus ex machina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, literally God in the machine. They they get out of it because the God does something that do- and doesn't explain themselves either. They're just... Yeah. I suppose that's... We have yeah. to just assume they were on our side. Well, they even they even made it look like a little kid pleading where they turn the camera up so Picard is looking at the ceiling as yeah. he's giving this speech and it looks like he's smaller than he is. You know, like he's looking up at someone bigger saying, please, can I have this? The unhero right. shot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, and there's that little bit, I think they try to, to get away with it by, you know, the mediator says, God has prevented your escape. And Beverly says, then your God is unfair. My son had no warning. His act was criminal. And the mediator says, we cannot allow ignorance of the law to become a defense. And that's when Picard responds. And it's like, so I don't know. It just seems like it's what is it like? What are they trying to say here? Like that we mm-hmm. should not enforce the law. Like I, it just seems very nebulous. And this I don't know. What's your point? They're making an anti rigidity statement. Yeah, that laws are meant to be in, interpreted and applied with a certain measure of understanding and mercy. And they're holding us up to they're holding up to us a society that doesn't understand that. Right. 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 Yeah, it, yeah. I, so, I think there's an argument for that, but this episode isn't it. <laughs> yeah. yes, this episode right. also is really American in its approach to the law. Uh, yeah. In America and Germany and Japan and other low-context cultures where you don't need a lot to get along, the laws are written very mm-hmm. precisely and then rigorously enforced. In right. high-context cultures like Italy and the Middle East, the laws are written more vaguely, but it's understood that they need to be applied in a certain kind of way and not as rigorously enforced. Right. Interesting. That is true. That is true. That, and that's one of the, another th- part of the things that kind of bugs me is, is that it's very, not even just Earth-centric, th- their approach to this, th- th- these, but very American-centric. And mm-hmm. if you are truly a federation of planets, and this is a criticism that goes back to the original series too, is... You're not a federation of planets. You're Earth dominating it culturally, yeah. the cultural hegemony of Earth over everybody else. And, and not even of Earth, of North America. Right, really. exactly. Exactly, yeah. So, anyway. Any further notes, comments on this episode, uh, Father Corey? Interesting that Wesley wanted to teach them baseball, even though we know that baseball has been gone for <laughs> centuries. Right, he, right. He says, you know, we've got a ball. Oh, yeah, we can get a stick and we can hit the ball. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jimmy? I'm sorry, what episode? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Just give you a chance to talk and say anything Mm -hmm. you had left, but that's fine. Let's let's wrap things up. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including the W family, Jim B, Jacob P, Simon R, and Gregory F. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. Now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron, thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter. When you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor to support all our shows, including this one, which makes your gift go even further. And we're closing in on our goal. We're more than three quarters of the way to our goal of $2,000 in new monthly pledges, which will help us with some of the things we got planned, like new shows and a new website. So won't you help us close the gap? If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now's the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. And we also want to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us each week. So let us know. What do you think of the TNG's episode, Justice? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page facebook.com slash starquest media or send an email to trek at sqpn.com we'll be back next time and we'll be discussing the nagus on deep space nine starring wallace sean <laughs> oh i love that until Quark! then <laughs> until then father cory stiga thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of star trek thanks don i'm gonna go watch galaxy quest again to wash the memory of this episode out of my head <laughs> there you go <laughs> jimmy aiken thank you as well Thanks, Dom, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, nice planet.